Hey everybody, I am Gina Bianca, life and business coach, salon owner, educator, mastermind mentor, and your host of the Gina Bianca podcast. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Gina Bianca podcast. Thank you guys so much for being here. Today, I want to talk about if you're getting paid legally or illegally, and I think it's an important topic because I get so many direct messages from people, and they're like, Gina, is this right? My salon owner is doing X, Y, and Z, and this is how I'm being paid, and I'm not allowed to do this, but I have to do this, and I'm just like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is illegal. This is not right, and the reason this happens is because uh, salon owners want to have have their cake and eat it too at times. And not all salon owners do this. Um, Some people get bad advice from their accountant. Some people just don't know any better. And I always say not everyone should be a salon owner uh, because there's a lot that goes into it. And, you know, following the law is one of those things. So it's a state by state thing. You know, I'm not an attorney. I'm not a lawyer. But I do know a bit about if you're getting paid legally or illegally. So I want to just kind of go through the difference between a 1099 and a W-2. So basically, if you are working for a company, what you should be experiencing. And if you're working for yourself, what you should be experiencing. So I hope that you guys love this episode. Be sure to share it. I hope that this episode helps shed some light uh, about what's going on in the industry. And if you're getting paid illegally, I will share with you what to do. So yes, listen to the end and share this episode. And thank you again so much for listening. So a little context before we get started, and I'm super passionate about this issue, mainly because my employee-based salon, Gina Bianca Hair, that I owned for about five years, we, we actually closed it down. If you're a new listener, I talk about this a lot on the podcast because GBH was like my business school. I learned so much uh, owning that salon, and I have a lot of experience in the salon ownership field. So I'm really passionate about this issue because... We were paying hourly, we gave benefits, we paid payroll taxes, we took great care of our employees, and it was an employee-based salon to the T. We did everything legally, and to be honest, it was expensive, it was time-consuming, it was stressful, and it was a lot, you know? So when I see salon owners uh, cut corners and break the law and mistreat their employees, I get a little fired up about it. And you know, if you're a salon owner and you simply didn't know, I'm not trying to shame you and I'm not trying to upset you, but this podcast may be eye-opening for salon owners to see if you're mistreating your employees, to see if you have some work to do when it comes to the legalities of your salon. And you know what? If you are a salon owner who is uh, messing up right now, just own it and figure it out and fix it, okay? Because there is always another day, and just because you did one thing wrong doesn't mean you're bad forever, you know? It doesn't mean you're bad at all. You could have just not known. But if you know this and you continue to scam the system, you know, I don't feel bad for you if your stylist listen to this and find out because it's really not fair for the stylist, and many of them don't know, You know, I'm always on the side of the salon owner, but I'm always on the side of the stylist as well. We are all in this together in this beauty industry that we love so much. We must elevate and educate one another. And, you know, the more um, the more we can be on the books with this and the more real we can be with this and the more we can elevate each other, the better it's going to be for the industry as a whole. So, again. If you're a salon owner who's been kind of doing this wrong and you didn't know, I'm not shaming you, but get it together. If you continue doing it wrong after you know what you're doing is wrong, I don't really feel bad for you at all. I I honestly am not a fan. And if you are a salon owner who's scamming the system and taking advantage of your employees, here is the warning. Listen, people know about this now. It's not good. You need to start taking care of your people and stop trying to have your cake and eat it too. Sorry, I'm calling you out. I love salon owners, but again, there are stylists who are getting taken advantage of and they just simply don't know. Like some people send me and like, listen, you would think like everybody knows this stuff because you do and you know if you're listening to this and you have a great business background you're gonna be like don't people know this the answer is no 
a lot of stylists do not know this. They didn't go to hair school to um, get a business degree. They went to hair school to do hair and to take care of their guests and to create art. You know, not every single person is business inclined and not every single person knows these things. So it's important to talk about it and it's important to educate one another. And it's important not to be shameful of one another if they don't know because you don't know what you don't know and you can't really punish yourself for what you don't know and you can always keep learning. So my goal for this podcast is to shed some light about, you know, what the different uh, pay structures are for salons, the different uh, ways you can be paid and what you should be expecting and what should be included. I wrote an ebook on this. It's called Read This Before You Finish Beauty School. All of my ebooks are available on GinaBianca.com if you click online education and ebooks. And they're also available in Mastermind Complimentary. So I do include all of my ebooks in Mastermind. And again, Mastermind is 30 bucks a month. Super affordable. We have to raise the price soon. So get in before the price goes up. And yeah, so I do uh, have some more content around this but it's pretty simple it's pretty black and white um salon owners try to give a gray area and it's you know some stylists will take that gray area because it might benefit them for a short period of time or it might benefit them for a while but in the long run you're missing out on what you deserve so let's get into it and let's talk about um, employees and independent contractors the difference what you should be expecting and what you should be looking for so before we get started, I think it's uh, interesting to talk about uh, this article I'm reading. It's called Hairstylists May Be Misclassified Workers, and it's WorkingSolutionsNYC.com. And it says only 10% of hair salons rely on direct employees, which means that the other 90% are either privately owned by individuals or hire independent contractors. Uh, this group has grown 83% over the past decade and is most popular labor model within the industry. So basically what this article is saying, and it's something that I've known for a long time, I'm not sure how accurate these numbers are because you know it's just a Google search, but when we look at our industry, it is blatantly clear that employee-based salons are dwindling away. And this is because many stylists want that freedom and flexibility of booth rental. They want to manage their own clients. They want to, actually a lot of them don't want to manage their own clients, but they want to come and go as they please. They want to have their own brand and they don't want to listen to anyone anymore. And it, it's, a lot goes into it, but many, many artists are going from uh, commission to booth rental, employee based to booth rental. And it is a trend that we've been seeing for many, many years. I've been in the industry for about a decade and you know, since I can remember, you know, it's always been the goal to go off on your own. And, you know, you build your clientele, you build your clientele, build your clientele, and then it's what's next. You know, we're always in that um, mindset to grow. And not everybody is in this mindset because there are a lot of people who would prefer to come to work, clock in, take care of their guests, have a lunch break, clock out, not have to deal with the bookings, not have to deal with the complaints, not have to deal with, you know, all of the stress and anxiety that comes with owning a salon and running a business. So there's always going to be a place for employee-based salons. And I always say employee-based salon owners are the unsung heroes. They are the ones that we need to to be like loving on because it sucks you know sometimes it's really hard to be a salon owner I was doing a coaching call with a salon owner the other day and I was just like what's missing from your dream career and she's like just being appreciated for everything that I do like people don't realize like how hard it is to be an employee-based salon owner especially with the landscape of the industry and you know I just wish my artists would see me and understand me and know that like I'm working hard and know that I have to deal with the looming fact that people um, there's always a chance someone's gonna leave me and it's a lot of abandonment it's a lot of stress and it's always training always repeat retaining cust um, stylists so we're trying to retain them if we can't retain them we're training 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 for it to happen all over again now I'm not trying to be doom and gloom but I have to be honest like the reason I closed my employee based salon down was because I did not know uh, I didn't know that 90% of my job was going to be trying to retain and trying and training people, you know, because people now with social media and they see all of these influencers, me included, like there's people who try to emulate me and want to do what I do. So, you know, they see all of these people and they want that dream. 
there are so many dreams that um, stylists can have and the opportunities are endless so it's everyone's craving growth it's not bad like it's not a bad thing but just the way that the landscape of the beauty industry is I wouldn't be an employee-based salon owner um, I just it's too stressful so I always give a lot of credit to those who are employee based because it's just a lot of work it's a lot of stress it's a lot of feelings it's a lot of emotions so yeah I, that, I wanted to just start and say like you know employee based salons are dwindling so if you work at one appreciate the, I'm going to tell you two things right now if you are an employee at an employee based salon appreciate your salon owner for taking on the stress, for putting their name on the door, for dealing with the clients, for doing your marketing, uh, for paying your payroll taxes, and for dealing with the stress of keeping that business open because you know what? You're having help fill your books. You're having help with all of that. Like you're working under a brand. It's not all on you. Um, and if you're not getting that from your employee-based salon, you're not really getting the benefits. You know what I mean? Um, another thing to think about, and this is something I was doing a coaching call the other day with somebody and she was so stressed out. She was just like, yeah, you know, um, she worked commission and she worked in a play based salon. Everything was, uh, cool. Everything was, you know, by the book, but the salon owner was so toxic and putting so much stress on her about the business and I'm guilty of this I used to put my stress of the business and financials on my team because I had no boundaries boundaryless salon owners you're taking away the benefit of being an employee because when you're an employee you come to work you do your job you go home that's the fucking best if you are involving your team in the owner's drama you're taking away the benefit of being an employee so why would they be an employee they have to deal with the owner's headache so why not just be an owner take that in if you're a salon owner with no boundaries because if you're dumping the owner's struggles on your team they might as well be an owner with all of the stress that they're going home with and this is in any career if the owner has no boundaries and they're dumping this on you you're not getting the benefit of being an employee. You're an employee with the stress of the owner with no benefit of being the owner. And if this is happening to you and you're stressed out and you love your salon, but this is the one thing that makes you wanna go rent a chair, you know, if you didn't have to deal with, you know, how much money is in the bank, if you didn't have to deal with uh, your co-stylist and your salon owner talking shit about them or stressing you out about everything and the training and everything that's a salon owner's responsibility. If you are dealing with that stress and you're like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm, I'm looking to go rent, but you don't really want to. Um, but you're kind of being pushed out for your mental health. I would challenge you to sit down with your salon owner and just say like, hey, I need some boundaries. Like if you want to make me a manager um, and pay me an additional salary to help you with this, if that's something you're actually interested in, great. But since I'm not the owner, I want to focus on my guests. Like the main reason I choose to work as an employee based salon is so that I could focus on my art and focus on my craft. You know, I need some boundaries here because I'm kind of getting to, and you guys got to be honest. If the more real you get, the better it's going to be. If you tell your salon owner, and listen, if your salon owner can't handle it, if you can't take the heat, get out the fucking kitchen, okay? Because if your people can't be real with you, they're just going to leave and they're just going to be fake. So if you told your salon owner, like, listen, I'm considering going to rent a chair because I, I just am dealing with the same stress as you as the owner because you're telling me everything and I'm not really getting the benefits of working at an employee based salon and if you've tried this and it's toxic and it's too much then I encourage everybody to do what's best for them you know what I mean I think that not everyone should be a salon owner I was not equipped or fit to be a salon owner of employees especially when I was traveling and I was so young and I didn't know any better and I had no boundaries and when people hurt me it hurt me really bad and I was really like no boundaries so I've learned a lot since then and I talk about it because it's real and I talk about it because it's happening every single day so anyway to wrap that up you know if you're an employee appreciate being an employee but are you really an employee 
right? And this is where it kind of gets a little bit fuzzy. And this is where the confusion happens because there's gray areas and there's this is how we've always done it or this is how it was done when I was a stylist and salon owners repeat this cycle and it's not legal and it's not okay so if you're a company employee if you work for a company you're working for that company your payroll taxes should be paid a large percent of your payroll taxes should be paid. And this is one of the main benefits of working at an employee-based salon and being an employee of a company. So since the company, since you work for that company and they're paying your payroll taxes and you're filing a W-2, you're employed by them, the company is responsible for providing everything for you, uh, meaning like your insurance, the business licenses, all of that stuff. Like the company is responsible for all of that. Like it's their business. You work under it. You show up with your shears and your license and you just start working. You don't have to do anything else. You don't need any insurance. You don't need any other stuff. They also should be providing your tools and supplies. So not every tool like they'll probably have you bring in a blow dryer and you're like cutting tools and stuff like that but anything that you might need bowls brushes color product all of those things should be provided for you to provide those services that goes into your cost of services this is your company that you work for breaking all of this down on a profit and loss statement and you are basically part of the service cost in that payroll so you don't need to be running a business if you're an employee of a company you show up you get paid and you have your payroll taxes done and you get a paycheck at the end of the week and you go home and you go on your merry way which is one of the big benefits of working for employee-based salons and it's a shame that there aren't that many anymore and that some of the ones that are open the salon owners have given up or they just are so burnt and you know there are very few incredible 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 employee-based salons and I know a lot of salon owners who are employee-based salon owners who kill it like they kill it, like the cream will rise to the top and like they are the best and they set a great example. But I do know a lot who are doing it all illegally and just scraping by. The other thing is that if you work for the company, expect them to provide you a schedule and you should be working the schedule that the company needs. Um, I give employee-based salons a lot of credit who are very flexible with scheduling because you should be working exactly what the company needs for the company to be profitable. It's great when we can be flexible and it's really amazing when employee-based salon owners are flexible. So if your employee-based salon owner is checking all these boxes I'm telling you and they also let you work a flexible schedule, it's really amazing. They also should be doing your bookings. Um, this is huge because one of the benefits of working for a salon is not having to deal with the customers like that. And, um, they would be responsible for your bookings and they would be responsible for handling the customers. And if they put that stress on you, I would ask for way more commission. If you have to do all of your books and manage all of your customers and your customers are reaching out to you past five o'clock or whatever time you leave, I, that's an, a situation where I would want more commission split because that and you know it depends on where you are and uh, how much you're getting paid but that additional stress and time requirement should not be free and when you're an employee-based stylist we're working with commissions here Another thing that your employee-based salon should be providing you is an hourly rate so you should be getting paid no matter what while you're there Okay, so if you're an employee of a salon and all of these things are happening and you are um, getting an hourly rate, you're getting paid no matter what while you're there, great. Sounds good. Now, where things kind of fall apart is when you're misclassified and the salon owner picks and chooses what they want to provide and how they classify you. So if you're an independent contractor, and this is the thing, if you work for a salon and the salon is 
booking your schedule, requiring you to work a certain amount of days, if they're requiring you to do your services a certain way, those three things alone, like you need to be a W-2 employee and they need to be paying your payroll taxes. Okay. Like just those few things. And salons are allowed to have standards, but what happens is they try to classify their employees as a 1099 independent contractor and they try to make you pay your taxes but they demand you to be an employee. So they want you to act like an independent contractor and but they get to have their cake and eat it too. So they get to have their salon brand, their salon systems, their salon schedule, and they get to treat you as an employee, but you're being scammed because your salon needs to be paying your payroll taxes to treat you this way. Yeah, let me say that again. So if you are working for a salon as an independent contractor, if you're filed as a 1099 and your salon owner is just like, yep, you just got to work Monday through Friday and just make sure that you're using these products and make sure that you wear black and only black. But your 1099 employee, you're being scammed because you're not able to run your business as an independent contractor the way that you want to run it, uh, but you're not getting your payroll taxes paid. So if you're an independent contractor, you should be able to make your own schedule. You should be able to handle all of your own bookings. Like you should have access to the computer and your bookings if, if you're an independent contractor. Like the clients who come in are your clients um, because you're running your own business. If the company was paying your payroll taxes and you were an employee of the company, I would say like you're probably going to have to sign a contract of their information and privacy policy and all of that. But if you're an independent contractor, you're technically, if you're hired as an independent contractor and filed that way, you're technically hired as a contractor who just comes in, does their services uh, their own way with no direction and no instruction. You just come in and, and do your thing and you're typically renting a chair. So it's pretty interesting how salons have gotten so creative with avoiding payroll taxes. Another thing is if you're an independent contractor, 1099, you're providing all of your own tools and supplies and color. So if you are 1099 and you're working at the salon and they pay you a commission, and you still have to use your own color, but they're like, oh, well, I gave you this guest, so pay me a commission off of it. Absolutely not, like no, because now you have no write-offs. You're not getting your payroll taxes paid, and they're also taking a percentage of your income and you're providing your own color. Like no, like you have no write-offs. It, it, it's like you're gonna end up be paying, you're gonna end up being paid so much less than, than you could. So if you're a 1099, Basically, you go in, you pay rent, you bring all of your own stuff, all of your own things. The salon owner should have no access to your books, no access to anything like that because it's your business, it's not theirs. And it really gets really confusing and gray area when people are blending these rules together and picking and choosing what they want to do and picking and choosing what works best for them. And the reason this happens is because many times salon owners have this amazing commission salon, they end up having people leave and they end up getting burnt out and the accountant says you know don't have an employee anymore put them all on 1099 uh, don't pay their payroll taxes anymore put them all on 1099 and um, they don't really explain to them the employee laws so st salon owners will be like okay this is the new thing you guys are all 1099s um, but I'll still pay you commission and um, we're going to go on our merry way. And stylists are just like, uh, okay, I don't get it. Who cares? And they just kind of do whatever. And maybe the salon owner will be like, you can come and go as you please. You know, I'm not paying you hourly. You can come and go as you please. You show up and, and stylists like that independence, but they're getting scammed because they're going to end up having to, you know, lose. If they're getting commission, they're losing their tax deductions because the salon is taking their tax deductions so i hope that this makes sense and it, it's like really like not cool when this happens but i get why it happens it happens because salon owners give up it happens because stylists don't know it happens on bad advice of the accountant it happens on repeating cycles that they have been a part of so like maybe that's how it was for them so when they opened a salon that's what they did and it's really not cool 
So if you're working for a salon as an independent contractor, or if you're working a salon as an employee, but you're filed as an independent contractor, not a good thing. Um, you're going to lose out at the end of the year. You're going to pay so many taxes and have not enough write-offs. And at the end of the day, you should be able to build your brand and do whatever you want. Like if a salon is, if you're working for a salon and you know, they're cramping your style, like they're kind of suffocating what you're allowed to do and not do, but you're a 1099, like you're losing out. You're not getting the benefits of going rental, you know? So it, the thing is, is like, you have to sit there and say, what's in it for me? And are you getting the true benefits of your situation? So if you're an employee, are you getting the true benefits of coming to work, clocking in, doing hair, focusing on your guests, clocking out and going home and not having to deal with the stress of being an owner, like booking appointments, dealing with unhappy customers, uh, dealing with all of the things that the owner is dealing with. Like if you're dealing with that, you might as well be a renter. You might as well be an owner. If there's no boundary with that, like what's in it for you? Most people, when they work for an employee-based salon, they do it because they want that mental peace. They don't want to be a business owner. But if the salon owner is kind of like having no boundaries with it and you are dealing with that, are you getting the benefit? And it's something to think about because you might love your salon, but there might be something off and you don't know what it is. And it's the leadership and it's the lack of boundaries. So I would challenge you to say something to your salon owner and share with them like, hey, I need some boundaries here. Like, I don't want to be an owner. If I'm going to have to deal with this, I'm going to go rent. And if you're rental, think about, are you getting the true benefits of a rental salon? The freedom, flexibility, independence, and ability to build your own brand. Do you truly have freedom? Is your salon telling you the hours you can work, but your rental or your independent contractor, that's illegal. Is your salon telling you how much you can charge or dealing with your clients or any of those things crossing that line? That's illegal. Are you getting the true benefits of 1099? Are you getting the true benefits of W-2? Those are the things you have to think about. And my ebook, if you're in Mastermind, make sure you go in the uh, video portal and you'll see my ebooks in there and you could read. There's like a bunch of pages on this. I'm kind of going off the ebook a little bit, but um, you know, there's a lot of information in here so much information um how to do your marketing how to recommend it's called read this before you finish beauty school and it's really just about like are you getting paid legally um what to look for in your salon having realistic expectations with your commission let's talk about that people will always ask me they'll be like gina i'm getting paid a 50 percent commission and i get this this and this is that fair is that enough and I always say, like, you know, it depends, but you, there are some benchmarks of what you should be thinking about. And if you're not getting paid a lot of commission, you have to look at, like, what, what the value is. So making it crazy to work anywhere else if you're a salon owner. So if I'm a salon owner paying commission, I want to make it crazy to work anywhere else. So I'm either going to pay high commission and try to add as much value into, you know, what they're paying me. So the other side of the commission. So if I'm paying 50%, I want to make sure that the other 50% that I'm getting from their services I want to make sure there's a lot of value there and that my stylists see like oh yeah like she takes 50% but look at everything I have now it's really about making it crazy to work anywhere else so if you're getting a high commission but you're not getting anything you know and that's sometimes what you have to deal with the more commission you get paid the less amenities and luxuries you're going to have and sometimes the higher commission you get paid they classify you as 1099 and they don't pay your taxes. So it's really good to know where you stand. And if you don't know, you got to sit down and talk to your salon owner. And if your salon owner makes you feel weird about this and the vibe is off and you feel scared to ask, that is toxic. That's a red flag. Hi, I'm a red flag. Nice to meet you. And that's, that's where you really need to start thinking about it. Your salon owner, whoever you work for, you should be able to sit down and talk with them about anything and it should not be a toxic situation. And if it is, I strongly encourage you to leave because it's life is too short to work in a job where you're stressed out, where it's toxic. And when you're afraid to even ask about your paycheck, it's not okay. And we have to elevate the beauty industry and people who shouldn't be salon owners need to get their shit together and figure it out. And stylists need to know what the hell is going on. Sorry to be super blunt about it, but I said what I said. So let's see. Let's talk about commission. So if you're making 50%, if you make over 50-50 commission, I have to say I would not expect anything more besides a paycheck, a stocked color room and retail shelves. I would also expect a fully functioning front desk 
uh, person to handle bookings, check out clients, cleaning and maintenance of the salon. Um, if you're paid over 60%, I would not expect the front desk person or much of a support staff or management unless the salon is huge and they can really, um, and they can really afford that, like if the profits are really big. But 60% commission doesn't leave a lot of room for the salon to pay all the general expenses, pay the manager, pay the payroll taxes, and um, maintain the salon. It doesn't leave a lot of room to, for amenities, you know. So you're not going to get health insurance. Like you, you're not going to, you can't have your cake and eat it too either. Like you can't expect crazy stuff. And when you go rental, it just flips. You know what I mean? Like you have to pay for health insurance. You have to pay your taxes. You have to pay for supplies. You have to spend the time ordering supplies. Like the time that you spend running your business when you're booth rental and owning your own business is like what the salon owner is paying the front desk guest care team to do. So it's like they're buying their time back. You would just be using your time. So just thinking about it like that. So if you're making 50% plus, I would be really grateful to have a fully stocked color bar, like a maintained color area where like, you know, you have everything you need, um, which I think you should always have if you're on, if you're employee based, I don't think you should be, if you're employee based, you should not be responsible for buying your own color. If you are an employee of a salon, you should not be responsible for buying your own color. So if you work for a salon, you got to show up there. You got to wear a certain thing. You got to do a certain thing. But you're going to Cosmoprof to buy color. Illegal. Not okay. Like that's red flag number one. Be grateful if you have a front desk person to do the books. Um, if the salon has cleaning people, assistants, any of that, and you're making 50, 60 percent, that's a good deal. And if you're on W-2 filed properly and getting your payroll taxes paid, good deal. It's a really good deal. Be grateful with that, okay? If you're getting 45 to 50%, if you're making 45 to 50%, I would expect everything listed before. Um, plus, I would expect some kind of vacation or 401k. These benefits are easy to offer at almost any salon. Um, I, I think it, it was pretty easy to do paid vacation and 401k. Um, I would not not expect anything more. And if you don't have those things, I would expect some kind of education. So that extra um, 5% that they're taking out, I would expect something for that 5%. So I would expect, you know, a 401k, some kind of like 401k match or something like a small percentage and then maybe a week of vacation. Because if you think about it, you know, if you're getting 45%, let's see, say you bring in 100k uh, a year times 5%, that's $5,000 times even if you cut it in half because you're getting commission on that that's 2500 so you would be getting like a paid week of vacation 2500 bucks that's that's like a not a bad um comparison you know what i mean so if you're getting 45 to 50 percent uh somewhere in there those extra percentages i would think 401k i would think a paid vacation for a week um, or some education, like $2,500 education or some educators brought in, that's, that's realistic expectations. But if you're expecting to have, you know, co continuing education, uh, health insurance, like all of those things, there's no room, like there's no room in the percentage to have that. Like it's not realistic. And if you're a business owner, you're like, yeah, no shit. It's not realistic. Like we're fucking scraping by, you know, most salon owners don't even take a 10%. And I think salon owners, all salon owners listening, the salon owners who are doing it right. And I see you, the ones who are doing it right. And you just as much as me can't stand the ones who are doing it wrong, um, who know they're doing it wrong. If you don't know you're doing it wrong, I'm not shaming you like, you know, now, and you can't unsee it. So I'm sorry to shake up your day, but the salon owners who are doing it right, you guys know um, the, the deal, you know, and you can't stand the people just as much as me who are who are scamming the system. And if you're a salon owner listening to this, like I think you should adjust your expenses so that you get 10 percent. If you're working behind the chair, you should make commission, but you should also make 10 percent as the owner. OK, like it is essential to make 10 percent and you should not feel bad about that. Like you're the one like leadership is a salary. And if you are an employee of a salon, you should encourage your salon owner to take a paycheck. Stop acting like the salon owner is driving away. And, and if your salon owner has a Range Rover, a Mercedes Benz, a nice ass car, like you should be happy for them. Like, don't be so jealous and resentful that someone's taking a portion of your check when you get 
the peace of mind of being an employee. The only time stylists are resentful is if they don't get that peace of mind of being an employee. So if you're making 40 to 45% commission, so now we're lowering it down. So if you're making 40 to 45%, I would expect everything I listed plus education or some kind of added value for clients. So I would also expect the salon to have assistance and support staff and management. So if you're making 40, 45% commission, I would definitely be expecting more amenities. So maybe you're offering coffee, tea, water, wine, espresso, cappuccino for the clients and maybe the clients are paying a higher ticket. So that 40 to 45%, even though you're making a little bit less you're getting a higher ticket I would expect continuing education maybe an assistant so I can double book and I can make more on my 40 to 45 percent like I would be expecting more um but still no still not health insurance and benefits really like it's too expensive and especially in America today it's an it's uh they're fucking us over when it comes to providing this for um our employees it, it's not a good time for business right now so you, you can't really hate on the salon owner because there's no it, we're getting choked out you know so if you're making less than 40 percent commission so if you're making less than 40 percent i would expect everything i listed plus some kind of health care or at least aflac I would also expect a large flow of new clients as the salon should be investing in some of your commission dollars into advertising okay I think that under 40%, the salon should be doing some kind of intense marketing. I think every salon should be doing intense marketing. And I also think every salon should require their employees to do marketing as well. So even just being like, hey, part of working here, part of your job description, since I'm paying you hourly um, or commission, whatever is greater, like you're working for this company. Whether you're doing hair or doing the front desk, like you're an employee at this company, like let's have a system for social media, like let's all post three times a week. And if the stylist is not doing anything or if the stylist doesn't want to do social media, like maybe there's something else they can do to help contribute to the advertising and marketing of the salon. Like there is something else they can do and you got to sit down, brainstorm and figure it out. So yeah, that's pretty much it. I used to pay between 38 and 40% commission to my artists and I paid it in a form of hourly. So basically my payroll budget was 35% and I always went over that, but we offered health insurance, education, consistent paycheck. I paid their payroll taxes. Our guest experience was absolutely incredible. Coffee, tea, water, wine, espresso, cappuccino, snacks, everything. Like it was so nice. I had full assistant. I had like five assistants at one point. We had two guest care people. We were marketing. We were taking care of the bookings. We had the cancellation policy. Like the, the stylist really didn't have to worry about anything, but I wasn't really like the most boundaried salon owner. So a lot of them had to deal with all of my bullshit. And essentially, you know, they wanted their own independence because they were dealing with the stress of being an owner, but they weren't an owner. You know, and they get resentful. People get resentful. And I'm not saying this is every person that's ever worked for me, but I've made the same mistake where, you know, I'm stressed out. We've got clients who are like this. I've got new people who aren't up to speed and I got to deal with the bullshit. And like, you know, I'm out there out there chain smoking cigarettes with people and bitching about the salon and they all talk. You know what I mean? Like it is what it is. Like this is what happens. Um, so you have to have boundaries and you have to be a strong leader. And it's really, really important to take that seriously. So you can give your employees the benefit of working at a uh, commission salon, an employee based salon. They need the benefit too. You know, it's not just payroll taxes, it's peace of mind. So we talked about a lot today. We talked about um, if it's, you know, if you're getting paid legally, if not. So basically to recap, if you're an employee based salon, um, if you're working as an employee for a salon, you know, you're working for that company, your payroll taxes should be paid. Um, you are an employee. You listen to what they say. You follow their systems and procedures. You use the products they want you to use. You work in the time standards they want you to work in. All of those things. If you are doing all of that, but your file does 1099, illegal illegal okay if the salon owner is picking and choosing and it feels blurred and it feels wrong and you feel like you're being scammed you probably are so what you have to do is you have to sit down with your salon owner and you can throw me under the bus if you want you can say I listened to this podcast um, from Gina Bianca can you listen to it and tell me if I'm crazy but am I being misclassified 
um and just ask them be like am I being misclassified like I'm not blaming you like I don't know if like you just didn't know or if this is how you've always done it um but you know one way to salvage a deal and employment is a deal so one way to salvage a deal is to never paint the picture of them doing something wrong because um you can't influence somebody who you are pointing the finger at in a bad way so go into every negotiation being like all right listen like i'm sure this is a misunderstanding i'm sure you aren't a piece of shit like you really have to think about like how you approach a situation because if you just go into a situation guns blazing making accusations it's not going to end up well and that person is not going to be honest vulnerable and real with you because they're going to be backed into a corner so i'm telling you what to do if you're misclassified right now and i know i told you in the beginning i'm going to tell you what to do if you're misclassified this is what you do You approach a situation with kindness, with understanding, and with the best expectation, and assume they don't know. So you need to assume that they have no idea that this is wrong. You need to assume that this is just how they've always done it, and you need to give them the benefit of the doubt because nine out of ten times salon owners have no idea what they're doing because they don't have the training and they don't take the time to train and they just follow in the footsteps of whoever led them before and... Listen, it's not always an I'm out to get you situation. So if your salon owner is listening to this, I get it if you didn't know. But if you do know and you're trying to get by with it, I see you too. So you need to take care of your people. We have to elevate the beauty industry. And, you know, people who are 80% and 1099 in this industry, um, you should be getting the benefits of being 1099. You should be getting the benefits of being an independent contractor. And if you're an employee, you should be getting those benefits too. It's really coming down to the stylist. And, um, you know, if we are able to feel good about our job and if we're able to feel valued and that we're getting what we're paying for, then we're going to take care of our guests that much better. So I hope you like this episode. I could talk about this topic all day. I really wanted to talk about it on the podcast because I do get a lot of questions about it. I get a ton of questions about this topic. And, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an attorney. I know it differs state by state, but pretty much it's all the same. The things I shared with you, you know, um, if you are being treated as an employee but not filed as one it's misclassification and if you have questions about it you need to take initiative and you need to go on google and you need to look up your state you need to call your labor board you need to take action and take initiative to figure out what's going on like don't just sit around and wonder and don't blame everybody else and just take it like you're like I mean, I guess if you're comfortable the way you're doing it and you don't want to change, it is what it is. You get the same relief from not making a decision that you do from making a decision. So it's really up to the individual whether you're going to take action on this or not. But the least I could say is if you feel like you're being misclassified, do some Googling, do some phone calls to the labor board, ask some of your friends. Um... Try not to start a mutiny in your salon. You know, keep it real and just talk to the owner. Like, I hate when people start a mutiny in the salon because they're too chicken shit to talk to the owner. Um, I think it's I think it's chicken shit, and I don't have any respect for that at all. So I highly recommend keeping it real. Um, give your salon owner the benefit of the doubt. Employee-based salon owners who are doing it right, who are putting in the work, who are putting in the time, and who are treating their people like gold. I see you. I respect you. Um, I'm a booth rental salon owner, but I was an employee based salon owner and I will never forget what it's like. I will never forget that experience. And I have a massive, massive respect for employee based salon owners. I always have and I always will. You are the unsung heroes. Stylist artists, you deserve the best. You deserve to get what you pay for, whether you're paying commission to your uh, salon or whether you're paying rent. You deserve the benefits of the work situation that you choose so again hope you love this episode hope you guys are doing well and i hope you have an amazing day don't forget to join mastermind for 30 dollars a month we are raising the price soon it's too cheap my business coach laughed in my face when i told her the price and what we offer so i gotta figure it out but you know i love to be accessible that's why i provide this free uh information like on the podcast like on my youtube channel i love to provide free education for you all and I love to help elevate the beauty industry. So please share this episode, tell your friends, and I hope you have an amazing day.